if that makes sense, is made possible by Family Life, a ministry made possible by you. Would you consider supporting the show by sharing one episode with a friend or even making a gift at familylife.org? Find all the Family Life original podcasts at familylife.org slash podcast. If I believe that God is my dad who wants to take care of me and knows what is best for me, and I'm drawn to something that he says isn't the best way for me to live life, I have to believe that God as as my loving dad wants to keep me safe. You're listening to If That Makes Sense, a Family Life original podcast where we talk about what life is really like as a young adult following Jesus. My name's Tim. I'm in Family Life's radio department. My name is Becky, and I'm in Family Life's development department and events department. I'm Robbie, and I'm in the performing arts department. It was such a good chat last time. It was all we could do to not just keep recording into the second episode, but it's the same same uh, three musketeers here today. We'll have a, a different lineup, most likely, for the next episode. But also going to be hard not to be here because, wow, uh, chapter two just rolls in. I just want to be here for all of them, <laughs> but I get it. I know. Well, that's, get that's part of why, and if you're joining us for the first episode you've listened to of this kind of third group of episodes, this third season, what we're doing this time is we're looking at Romans with these series of episodes. And it's, wow, just such a cohesive story that Paul tells. It's, a, it's an argument, really, the whole book. And we're looking at it because it has something to say to exactly where we are today. It has something to say to where anybody is. It's a universal book. It's a timeless book. And it's anything but an old, old book. It's, it's for today. It's for right now. So last time we we're looking at how, well, just how universal the knowledge of God is. We all know who God is. Even if we don't admit it, we know that there is a God and that we're accountable to him. And we've got that thing, that conscience that's working, where it's God's way of reminding us that there is a law. And even if we don't know by name who the one is who gave it, we know that we've broken it. That's a universal understanding we all have of our guilt. So today, Paul, we're looking at a different part of what Paul's written in chapter one. We're still in chapter one. The whole book of Romans is super meaty. And no, we're not pastors. We're not doing a sermon here. We're just looking at how it affects us today, what it has to say to our world. Would you like, Becky, to read uh, chapter one, verses 24 to 32 to start us off? Sure. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their eyes to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they changed the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to debased minds to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they do not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Well, there's a lot there, Paul has to say. Uh, certainly talk, a fun list there at the end. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I would love to just jump in here. So this passage for a long time was, was troubling to me. Mm. And the reason it was troubling to me was because I believe that same-sex temptation is a temptation, uh, like Mm. any Mm -hmm. other temptation, something that you know you shouldn't do, and yet it's somehow appealing to you, interesting to you, whatever. And and I just feel like this is an issue that the church likes to scoot around or just not really talk about, or, well, it's this... If you're choosing to act out this way, it is, you know, condemnation, it's wrong. And clearly, okay, well, we can see here that the act is wrong. Yeah. But I would like to speak to the same-sex tempted 
Christian because mm. I believe that that is a thing, yeah. just like any temptation. And I like to use the word temptation even more than uh, attraction. I feel mm. like same-sex temptation uh, to me seems more biblical even than to say same-sex uh, attraction because it, it, I believe, is a temptation. So I used to read this and think, well, this isn't this isn't very fair because it's sort of saying God was like, well, I guess, I guess I'll just give up on you. Just do whatever you want. Mm. And almost making it sound like it was God's fault in a way? Like, wait a minute, this, he just gave them over? That's not fair. What about people that are like, I don't want to feel these confusing things. Why would you give me over to them? I And what I realized about this passage is that you have to back up the train. And it's all about the context. And mm. when you keep backing up the train, you realize something. And so you start with, so God abandoned them. Is, is my New Living Translation, verse 24. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's that little word, so God abandoned. Well, why is that there? Well, you back up the truck again. And that's what we were talking about last week. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. Okay, well, well then you back up. Well, what about verse 18? God shows his anger from the heavens against all sinful, wicked people. And so you just keep backing up the, yeah. the train, backing up the truck. And so when you get down to that spot where it's so God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired, as a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. Um, well, well, why is it that he's abandoning them or giving up on them or do whatever you want? Fine. You want it? You want the lollipop because you're screaming and crying? Take the lollipop. You know, whatever. And when you back up the truck, it's because... They knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as mm. God. Yeah. And I feel like that's really important is where do you stick God in the equation? Mm -hmm. Because if you're dealing with whatever, whatever it is, whatever sin, whatever temptation, I think you have to say, okay, where does, what's my view of God? If I believe that God is my dad who wants to take care of me and knows what is best for me, and I'm drawn to something that he says isn't the best way right. for me to live life. I have to believe that God, as my as my loving dad, wants to keep me safe. The yeah. father is not going to say, sure, you want to go play in the street? That mm -hmm. sounds like fun. Go do it. Right. Your right. child may want to go play in the street, but your father knows you're going to get splattered by a semi. But, but I like trucks, says the three-year-old <laughs> right. boy. I know you like trucks. That doesn't mean you can go play in the street. Wow. And yeah. so this dad who loves his kid is keeping, is saying, I don't want you to go play in the street because I don't want you to get splattered. I know what's best for you. Wow. There's a lot of wisdom in that kind of analogy. And I, I when you put it like that, that's super helpful for me because I think, oh, I can understand that. This other issue is really confusing, but I can understand it when you explain it like that. And of course, the other issue, it's homosexuality or you could expand it for the purpose of what Paul's talking about. I think it can have to do with any part of our culture's sexual revolution, really. It can be confusing for us today to know how to deal with this. And like, we know the Bible has the truth, but it's a, it's a difficult topic. So I'm super thankful we can just hide behind the truth of God's word. It's not about what we think about it. It's looking at what, like you said, Robbie, our, our loving father says about it. Really think it's interesting how you broke down the difference between struggling with same-sex temptation. I, that's interesting you put it that way. I've always, you know, heard people in the church refer to it as same-sex attraction. I think that makes both ways make sense, but I really think it's interesting to use the word temptation. That's not the way the world around us sees it. The world around us makes it, if you feel these things, those feelings define you. And boy, there's just there's just a lot there. There's just a lot to to what the Bible has to say about this topic. Yeah, there's definitely a lot to unpack there. And I like the way, Robbie, that you presented it and brought it to light because it reminds me of a conversation I was having with my brother the other day. And we were talking about just different temptations and things that can cause us to stumble in our walk with the Lord. And later on in this verse, it list a whole bunch of different things that are mm. dishonoring to God. Mm -hmm. And it puts them all on the same level. Envy, murder, gossip. There's not, with God, there's not a one sin is worse than the other. Mm. They're all in the same. And so my brother and I were talking about that concept and the fact that 
it seems to us in the Christian culture, in the Christian realm, it's very easy for us to suddenly be like, oh, you deal with same-sex attraction. All of a sudden you're labeled and you're an outcast and you're looked down upon or, oh, you need to repent and go before the church and do this to get over that or, oh, you just need to trust God and that'll go away. Hmm. And we seem, as a Christian culture, we seem to have taken that and put it in kind of a category of its own. And there's other sins that the church has done that with. But, I mean, for now we're talking about yeah. homosexuality because it's right here in the scriptures. Um, and so it was just a good reminder that temptation – is not sin. Yes, we're all presented with that temptation. I am tempted by certain things. And that is where I have to step back and say, okay, where am I placing God? Am I following God? Am I honoring God? And am I choosing the path of worshiping God and walking away from this temptation, even though it's really tempting and I really want that piece of chocolate cake or whatever the sin is? Mm -hmm. Am I what am I choosing in that moment? Or am I choosing to give in to temptation and then actually commit the sin? Um, and I think that's where it gets hard in the Christian world because I really don't know very many people who would admit that they struggle with same-sex attraction. And I wonder if part of that is because of the stigma that is then placed on them mm. that I think we need to challenge ourselves church-wide to get rid of. But it's also, you know, we all deal with different temptations and sins. So it's also looking at, oh, what am I dealing with? Because in God's eyes, that's on the same playing field. Mm. Um, Mm. And so I like the way, Robbie, that you painted that of a temptation instead of an attraction, because really that's at the root of it. If we're going to address it, we need to address the root problem. And the root problem is temptation. And what am I doing with that? Am I sinning or am I choosing to honor God? you, I think you said it perfectly. I'm glad you jumped in when you did because that's exactly why I was thinking the same thing. You said something about cake, which made me like, oh, I think imagery is really helpful for me. And mm-hmm. I think it's helpful for all of us, which is why God is constantly painting pictures for us in scripture. Like this is like this. This is like this. And so it's like, OK, well, if there is that that cake, that cookie, that thing that you you want to eat it. And then what do you do? Do you go and eat it and put it into your mouth and ingest it? And there is the sin if if the analogy is the cookie is you're not supposed to eat that. You eat it. Okay, well, what's the difference between, oh, man, I want to eat it. I see it. It's there. But whew, I'm going to walk into the other room. You know, I'm going to leave that cookie oh, there. Right. You know, like I want to eat it because it looks and smells tasty. So is that sin, knowing that the cookie looks and tastes delicious? No, that's being tempted toward it. Or Jesus in the wilderness he was tempted, and and Jesus was tempted in every way we are except without sin. That's in the scripture somewhere. I don't know where. You go find it for yourself. But I know it's there. So it's I want that. I want to make bread for myself, but I know that's sure. wrong. I, I'm tempted to throw myself off the temple. I'm tempted to worship Satan because then I could have the kingdom now, but I'm not going to actually do it. It's maybe not that. He was like, is there any way, like, is there any other way, God? Like, do I have to go to the cross? Like, he was tempted, like, I wish there was an easier way. He wanted to not have to go to the cross, but yet Mm. he went to the cross. So sometimes when you want that, whatever it is, I'm drawn toward, I'm Mm. tempted toward, the difference between realizing that temptation is there and saying, I'm going to walk away from the cookie, or, well, I want it, so I'm going to eat it. That difference, I think, between sin and temptation is really important to clarify. Yeah. Martin Luther, pretty sure, said something to the effect of, you can't stop birds from flying over your head, Mm. but you can keep them from making a nest in your hair. Mm. So you can't help it that a temptation might fly by you. You know, you you can pray that that doesn't happen. It might happen, though. That's not going to be your fault if a temptation flies over your head. But if you let it fly over your head and then when it lands on your head, you say... Oh, it can stay there. I'm not doing. It's not doing any harm. Mm-hmm. Well, it's going to make a, a nest in your hair. <laughs> mm-hmm. it, it's entertaining thoughts where I think we get into sin, where we let temptation become sin, even if we don't do what the thought is urging us toward. Even just entertaining that thought, letting it stick around in our head any longer than that fleeting moment, 
that's where we start to get into a sin that we've chosen because we're choosing where our thoughts are. And like Becky said, there's that whole list. It's like this and this and this. And sometimes the little ones that we overlook, you know, pride, envy, whatever, like, oh, that's not that bad. That's not as bad as lust, you know, or yeah. whatever. But that there's that whole list of things yeah, yeah. there. There's a lot of things that oh, we man. gloss over Absolutely. that are a big deal. Absolutely. He puts them in the same category as this other list of sins. And it, it just, well, it ought to be humbling to us that this thing Paul's talking about as it's against our nature. He's saying, oh, in the same list, by the way, are things like disobeying your parents. I, I do want to ask this question of each of us here. That question, when we're talking about homosexuality or same-sex attraction, same-sex temptation, did God make me this way? What is... What does a chapter like this, what does part of God's word like this have to say to that super difficult question? Wow, I wasn't expecting that question. Well, I didn't tell you I was going <laughs> to ask no, it. No, you didn't. I decided I'm, to ask it a few seconds ago. I'm trying to relate it to this passage. We all know that, that God created us and that God made us. Um, and we have the decision to make of what we do with him. We acknowledge that God is here and around us and we see him all through creation and in our everyday lives, are we choosing to then take that knowledge and turn it into worship and obeying him? Because like verse up in verse 19, it says, for uh, what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. And, you know, struggling through that question of did God make me this way? Or if you flip it to the argument of I was born this way, um, Back in Genesis and in the scriptures, it says that there's going to be enmity between the woman and the serpent, which is Satan, and there's going to be that strife, and every person born is going to be born with sin. Um, so one way that it was presented to me that I've kind of latched onto is we are all born with a sin nature. We are all also created uniquely and individually. So to me, it rationalizes out that we're all going to struggle with different sins that are tempting um, to each one of us. I can't explain to you where my temptations come and why certain temptations are harder for me to say no and walk away from. But others, it's like, I don't even struggle with that. Mm. So all I can do is point back to the scriptures and to the, we have the knowledge of God, and we have a way to gain more knowledge through his scriptures of who he is, what am I doing with that knowledge, mm. regardless of what I'm struggling with? Mm. Right. And I think that's I think that's what it comes back to is, well, how do you view God? Mm. And I think that's going to answer a lot of questions. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. You know, they're in verse 21. And so I think, well, what is your view of God? Of God, and if I'm viewing him as a father who wants to take care of me and is uh, telling me the best way to live, whether it's avoiding certain things or doing certain things or whatever, then I have to trust that his way is going to wind up being the most fulfilling and best way for me. Mm -hmm. I've also found sometimes I have to answer a question with a question. Hmm. And mm -hmm. Jesus did that, so, you the know. The question I would pose to your question is, as easy as it is to ask, uh, why did God do this? Why did God make me this way? Why did God let this happen? I like to flip it and say, how can I use this to honor the Lord? How can I use this to serve others? How can I use this to trust God? And I flip it instead of saying, well, why, why, why? First of all, we never really get answers why. Job never, Job was never, he never got the why. Wow. We, we kind of get the why of the story mm. of Job. Mm. He never, he never wow. got the why. And if we did get the why, if God sat us down and was like, here's why. Would we even like the answer that he came up with? Probably Man. not. Man. Probably not. So I have found that with whatever the issue is, rather than asking why is I flip it to how. So as soon as you're tempted to ask a why question with whatever it is you're dealing with with God, you may need to flip it to how 
can God use this in my life? How can God encourage me to worship him through it? How can God use it? You mentioned the birds flying over, and I love that image too, where, well, the geese are going to fly, but are you going to let them stay and build Mm. their nest and have their eggs and hatch their babies, and now all of a sudden your beautiful pond has geese that you didn't want, yeah. you know, they're going to fly. You can't stop that. But are you going to let them build the nest? And I reminds me of when they they lower the lame man down through the roof and he says, you're healed. And all the, you know, Pharisees and whoever was there were like, well, what, what is this guy? What's this guy doing? He can't forgive sins. And Jesus says, why are you entertaining evil thoughts within you? Hmm. And that just like really struck me in a different way. Like, like you said, why are you entertaining? If you're going to entertain someone, you're going to get your house ready. You're going to clean it. You're going to set the table. You're going to get out your fancy plates and stuff. You're going to put the best meal forward. You're going to entertain them. You want them to stay a while and be comfortable and you're going to work at it to entertain them. Entertaining Mm -hmm. someone takes work. And he's saying, why are you entertaining evil thoughts within you? And their evil thoughts were about, well, you're not really God, whatever. And he, but he could, he knew he could look into their minds and say, not, why do you have evil thoughts? Everybody has evil thoughts. Why are you entertaining evil thoughts? And that just strikes me and makes me think of 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I will throw this reference out there because it's been so helpful for me. Maybe it'll be helpful for you, listener, whoever you are. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. So there's the first thing, whatever you're like, oh my goodness, I'm alone in my temptation. Whatever it is, Hmm. it's common. Hmm. It says right here, it's totally common. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, not well, if you're tempted. (laughs) So first of all, no temptation is uh, uncommon. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Mm. Like, it's all promise. I promise you, you'll be tempted. I promise you, it's very common. I also promise you, I'll help you find a way. Oh, man. It's not not an easy conversation. It's not an easy topic. It's not one that our culture is really excited about us talking about. That doesn't mean we get to avoid talking about this, though. Specifically here in chapter one, Paul does talk about homosexuality, but that's not all he talks about because he talks about, well, just sin in general, like disobeying parents and greed and anger and and all these things. Um, Boastful. Well, we've never done that before, right? No, we have. So we're all on this list, whether you've struggled with same-sex temptation, whether you've struggled with disobeying your parents, you know, at any point in your life, or whether you've ever been heartless. These are all sins that are on this list. We're all in that place before God. And that's what I think is so cool, again, about the book of Romans. It's totally universal. It puts us all on the same playing field. And as we're going to see in just a few chapters here, it gives us all the same solution. Because it all points to Jesus. That's why all. That's why there's all this bad news. Because it's got to point to the good news. And in the end, it's telling us, look, the world's broken. You ever wonder why the world's broken? Yeah, it is. It's because, like you said, Robbie, take it back to what we worship. And you've talked about it too, Becky. Take it back to what we worship. Following God's way is best. And I just can't wait till we get to that episode when we get to see the solution Paul poses to us. I'm just excited to be on this journey with you all. Get to go through God's word like this. Yeah, and Mm -hmm. and what I like about it is you are forced to walk through (laughs) the roads that are like, nobody wants to talk about whatever. And it's Mm -hmm. like, but it's right here. So we're going to talk about it because it's right here. Sorry, folks. It's the Bible. We're talking about it. What a better starting place than scripture Mm. talking about it first Mm -hmm. and pointing us to the way to talk about it and to handle it. Yeah. Thank you for joining us for If That Makes Sense, the family life podcast about what life is really like as a young adult following Jesus. If you enjoy the show, please send it to a friend. Your genuine appreciation of the show is the best way for word to get out. And it would make our day if you left us a rating and a review wherever you found this episode. 
Family Life has more great original podcasts that you can check out at familylife.org slash podcast. Thanks again, and we look forward to having you along for the next one.